if I get nervous when I'm doing this. One, two, three. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Villasenor. Our project uh, presentation for today is complications of auto therapy. My name is Alan Angel, and I will also be participating in this presentation. So um, our topic mainly involves the complications and the preventions of O2 therapy. Um, as you know, as respiratory therapists, we are to know when to give oxygen therapy to patients, what devices and so on, which our other classmates will be going over with you as well. Um, however, our main um, focus for today is learning when we have to stop the O2 therapies or uh, what to look out for so you know we're not causing any harm or any damage to the patient's health. Um, that way they can recover or that we just don't like you know uh, mess with their system and all that. Um, so the first topic will be O2 toxicity which Jose will be talking about. So for O2 toxicity, um, it's uh, lung damage that can happen from breathing in too much uh, extra supplemental oxygen, free radical develop and damaged lung tissue causing infl inflammatory response um, that causes pulmonary edema and atelectasis. Usually occurs when um, patients are on a higher FiO2, 50% or more um, for 18 hours or longer. Hyperbaric oxygen um, therapy patients exposed to prolonged high levels of O2, underwater divers, and premature infants. For the muscular, we have twitching. Uh, respiratory, we have jerky breathing, um, irritation, coughing, pain, shortness of breath, tracheal bronchitis, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then for the eyes, we have visual field loss, nearsightedness, cataract formation, bleeding, and fibrosis. And then we also have the central, which will be seizures. Yeah, so um, this really does uh, usually happen if they're uh, over 50% for 18 hours or longer, like Jose also stated. Um, so one thing to look out for, a few things to look out for are all those symptoms when you're giving uh, such a high O2 therapy uh, to the patients. Um, so you should also be checking, um, like auscultating, make sure that you are also not having any lung damage or, um, causing any atelectasis, which we will be going over later on, um, as one of the complications of O2 therapy. And then for, um, the O2 toxicity, I also wanted to add on because, um, there's, some. Um, I believe some people did have questions before when we talked about it, about, um, underwater divers, why it affects them. So the reason that it affects them is because there's a atmosphere, um, pressure change. So at one point when they go a little bit deeper and deeper, what's going to happen is that since the atmosphere pressure change, they're going to be, um, taking it a hundred percent of O2. Um, well, oxygen, and that's what um, makes them get O2 toxicity. Yeah, the atmosphere pressure changes the level of oxygen, the level of, of FiO2 um, given. So um, this is just something that divers or expert divers are well aware of, and that's something that they really look out for because it can be very damaging to their health and it can be um, life-threatening. So... Um, definitely expert divers, especially the ones that go very deep inside the water, they are very well equipped and they're very knowledgeable on these types of things. For the second part, um, the second one that we have would be is ROP, which is uh, renopathy of prematurity. So ROP is an eye disorder that occurs when the blood vessels in the back of the eye, the retina, um, grow abnormally. It is uh, most common in premature infants or those born um, prior to 31 weeks gestation. So infants with uh, low birth weight and also and low, low, sorry, low birth weight are all are also more at risk. Um, weigh, they usually weigh like three pounds or um, less. Uh, keep FIO, SPO2 um, 86 to 90% to prevent blindness. So usually if you give too much oxygen to a premature baby like that, you would cause um, eye damage and you can cause blindness. Um, it can, I think they can improve um, 
survival and reduce um, complications of RP are delayed cord clamping, keeping baby warm and preventing hypothermia, giving a course of steroids to a mother who is um, having a premature baby can also help with ROP. About 14, um, K, about 14,000 babies suffer from ROP with 90% um, only having a mild form of the disease. 400 to 600 babies become blind due to ROP. Yeah, so going off um, based on what uh, what we have here as well is uh, whenever you want to give O2 therapy to um, pre premature babies, you, al you always want to start at the lowest dosage. So you want to start off at one liter per minute, um, a nasal cannula, and if they need a little bit more oxygen, you can crank it up a tiny bit, like maybe go into one intervals, um, because uh, it's just that since they're not fully formed, that O2 um, therapy, the, the drug, the O2, um, will be kind of like be messing with uh, those blood vessels be, uh, behind the retina. So it's not something that happens to every single baby, um, every single premature baby, but it's something definitely that as respiratory therapists that we have to be well aware of uh, to avoid these types of things. Um, so yeah, all the things that he mentioned are, uh, are ways to prevent um, ROP in, uh, in premature. So the, the steroids is just to help um, the baby develop a little bit quicker so that way, when they're born, they're not as premature, and this reduces the the chances of getting ROP in, in prematurity. Okay. So um, another thing, another complications of O2 therapy is uh, O2 induced hypoventilation. So this generally happens with patients with end stage lung disease, so COPD patients, because they're CO2 retainers. So um, the way our body works is um, our levels of CO2 in our body, it kind of, it, it gives us that, uh, it gives that, um, how, how do I say it, like this um, type of stimulant to help us breathe. So it tells us when we have to be uh, inhaling uh, more oxygen. So the higher the, the CO2, um, the mean, it means that the less, um, the less our body wants to breathe. So our PCO2 is what stimulates us to breathe, and these patients are not normally able to breathe normal uh, normally because they have CO2 high CO2 all the time. Since their bodies are not used to that CO2, these patients rely on hypoxemia, so they rely on low levels of um, of uh, O2 contents inside their bodies. So meaning that, like for example, our normal um, SpO2 should be between 94 to 97 percent, right? So for these types of patients, their kind of threshold, their level of SPO2 should be lower than that because um, if we give them higher FiO2 than what their body's uh, threshold is, then they're basically going to stop breathing. So their regular FiO2, uh, SPO2 should be no more than um, 90, 91%. 91% is or, already a little bit going, going over too much. So our goal is not to exceed more than the SPO2, 90%. Um, again, since always retaining CO2, um, uh, those levels are always going to be high. So we really have to look out for their oxygenation. We don't want to give in too much oxygen because then their bodies are just going to tell them to stop breathing. Yeah, so yeah. for auto-endurance hypoventilation, then we would always just have to make sure that we're um, monitoring their SpO2 and uh, making sure that we're not giving them too much oxygen because then um, that would be a problem for them. So another major um, complication of O2 therapies, uh, and this basically mainly goes for just having way too much oxygen in the body. It's called nitrogen washout atelectasis. So high levels of FiO2 causes uh, nitrogen to diffuse out of the lung. Um, nitrogen, what it does is it's, it's it's basically a filler for the alveoli. Alveoli has a uh, um, different gases in there, but the main um, gases will be nitrogen and oxygen. Um, nitrogen um, makes up most of the the space in the in the alveoli. So um, 
just pretend it's it's like a, a balloon and um and if you're taking away all the nitrogen which consists of most of the surface area inside like it takes up most of the surface area inside if you're removing the nitrogen you're basically deflating that balloon and it's just collapsing which is atelectasis atelectasis is the finest partial or complete collapse of the lung um, so this really happens when you're giving the patient high levels of FiO2, which is more than 60%. Um, same thing as um, like ROP or the other ones. Um, you just really have to measure or like know how much um, oxygen you're giving to them. Now, this doesn't really happen to every single patient. This is just a complication that can happen. Uh, our bodies have so many, 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 many alveoli um, inside our lungs. So um, some of them are not are already going through atelectasis. Some of them are just clogged. Oh, um, a few of them here and there is not really a big deal. Um, it becomes a big problem where like a big portion or like a um a bigger portion of the of the lung is collapsed because that way uh if if that happens then the patient is not getting that um good amount of oxygen through their body so there's uh less alveoli means less diffusion happening so then less uh of everything basically so the patient has higher uh, chances of going through hypoxemia and going through other complications there it goes through that um so the, the the big main takeaway from this is really just pay attention to um, auscultate, like you um, check the lung um, lung sounds and all that to kind of figure out if a nitrogen washout is happening within patients. Um, and remember, always uh, try to kind of keep FiO2 less than 60% unless the patient absolutely needs it then obviously we do have to deliver that, but we do have to keep all of this in mind that nitrogen washout um, can happen and it can be very dangerous. Um, something that can um, help open up those uh, um, alveoli in case it does happen is um, PEP therapies. Um, that helps keep um, pressure in the alveoli. It keeps um, the walls uh, of the alveoli uh, open because of the amount of pressure from the air coming in. Um, it's something um, that we can go over later on. I, I'm, I'm sure one of the other students will be going over PEP therapies and all the other devices that we can use to kind of keep those um, those alveoli open. Yes, that's correct. And then as, as we have uh, the picture on the side, you will be able to see how the normal alveoli looks versus the collapsed alveoli. Okay. So these are our sources for our presentation um if there's any questions please uh has, don't hesitate to email us or um or just reach out to us and then we'll be able to respond properly okay thank you my name is alan and um thank you so Jose. much my name is Jose. <laughs> All right. hold on i just gotta um stop